Before we start this episode, I want to take a moment to introduce what I hope will become a series, and I'm calling it Measure All The Things. The series will focus on one metric every episode to investigate and hopefully end up at a point where we, the amateur enthusiasts, can come up with a satisfactory, cheap and easy way to measure that thing. I hope to cover all manner of topics from sound to light to vibrations, speed. The sky is literally the limit here. Also, I'm very open to suggestions. If you have a topic that you think is worth focusing on, let me know. Now let's set some boundaries for this to begin with. What do we actually want to achieve in each episode? As you can see, I've been writing a list of my initial aims as a mission brief. Quickly run through them. Number one, DIY means no special equipment. We we could go out and buy a meter for just about anything. Well, we're not going to do that. We're, we're going to make our measuring equipment from scratch. Number two, cost. We don't want to spend any more than we have to. We're looking for cheap ways to do this. Number three, there's no point in making a meter if it isn't accurate or at least consistent. We're going to try and test our results against other methods or data sources if we can. Number four. Oh boy. Uh, yeah, it's very easy to get bogged down and end up down a rabbit hole forgetting what you started out trying to do. We are not perfectionists. We are going to be okay with good enough. Number five. Of course, for every method, there's going to be people that say, why did you do it that way and not another way? The thing is, you can always improve on any idea. That's that's progress. That's how it works. We're going to go as far as we can realistically, and then there has to be a video at the end of it. That's, that's just the nature of, of the beast. We're taking a trip into the unknown. If it fails, if we can't actually get the results that we want, it is still a win because we've found an answer, even if the answer's no. It's still an answer. So let's begin with the first episode. Roll the tape. Um, there's no tape, but let's just begin. Let's start. Welcome to Measure All The Things. Ah, air quality. A bit of a hot potato these days, I think. On the one hand, air pollution has been worse in the past, and it really tends to improve rather than get worse. Um, we don't have fogs known as pea supers now for example do we however the evidence is piling up recently all pointing to the same conclusion which is that air pollution is bad it's very bad for your health and without angering people who drive ludicrous and unnecessary vehicles stop doing that by the way localized pollution is still a big problem for some of us if not many of us if not all of us so stay tuned, we're about to begin a journey into pollution sensing that will not only be quite the eye-opener, but it will also give you a cheap and surprisingly accurate solution to the normally unanswerable question, how clean is my air? Now, unlike most parts of this series, to kick off we're playing catch-up, this is a project that is documented here retrospectively. I already have all the answers before I begin. Spoiler. I made a fully working portable pollution sensor about a year ago, and here it is. But fear not, it may be working, but it is not finished. Let's start at the beginning. First we need to do a little groundwork before we get onto the meat of the video. Air quality is a fluff word to me. What are we actually talking about? Well, luckily we can define exactly what we're talking about in terms of this project. We're talking about particles. And as a side note for the pedantic, air quality measurements can also include gases. But this is really not within the scope of a hobby project, at least as far as I'm aware. Plus, the two tend to coexist, so measuring one does usually imply the other, at least in terms of localised air pollution, say from traffic or industry. Perhaps we will investigate gas detection in a future video because you certainly can do for some gases, if not others, in the hobby area of equipment. So let's do a little bit about how these pollution sensors work. All the sensors I've encountered seem to operate in roughly the same manner. Um, it's not entirely true, there are expensive sensors that exist, but we'll not dwell on that here. All the affordable sensors use lasers. The airflow into the sensor can be either passive or active. In, say, a smoke alarm, it tends to be passive, so the air is allowed to diffuse through the device by itself naturally. But if you want faster and more responsive readings, you can include a fan to force the airflow, or in fact, sometimes a resistor, which heats up and creates airflow. This means the readings can be literally taken in near real time. 
And by the way, a smoke alarm, the optical smoke alarms, not the radiation based ones, they work exactly like the device we're about to see now too, without the fan, but it's the same principle. So the air is blown through a light sealed cavity. Being light sealed is important because inside there's a photodiode laser or some other kind of beam is projected from one side to the other. The opposite side is designed not to reflect any light. The intention is that the laser beam will just disappear if the air is clear. And off to one side at some angle is a photodiode. Now it's not in the path of the beam, which is it's curious. But if a particle breaks the beam, then it scatters the light. And what happens then? It bounces all over the place and it bounces into the photodiode. This is simple and clever, but it actually gets better. It turns out that you can not only tell when there's a particle in the chamber, but you can actually use some fairly complicated mathematics to determine the size of the particle. So if you want to read about this, I'll put a link in the description, but be advised it's fairly complicated. This is the Plan Tower PMS5003 PMS 2.5 air quality sensor. It might not look like much, but as you can see, it has a big round hole and four small holes. So we found intake and exhaust. It does contain a fan and it's actually super cheap, being available for around £20 in the UK. For what it does, this is an absolute bargain. A quick note if you plan to buy this, please make sure that you're buying one with this cable and preferably the breadboard adapter. It is not the end of the world if you just have the cable, but if you buy it with neither, you're going to have to make or find an adapter to these pins and good luck with that, it is small. Let's take a peek at the datasheet. As you can see from the diagram here on page 2, the method of operation is pretty much exactly as we expected, with a laser causing scattering when exposed to particles inside a cavity and producing an electrical signal, presumably by means of a photodiode, which then feeds into an amplifier and a microprocessor. The microprocessor will not only analyse the signal and create a result based on the signal processing, but it also encodes it into a signal that we can then understand with our Arduino. Now, I want to apologise for the episode being a bit theory heavy at this point. It's just the nature of the beast, unfortunately, with measuring particulate. We are getting there, there's not much more to go. I want to draw your attention briefly without getting bogged down here. The range of measurement in the spec sheet is from 0 0.3 microns to 10 microns. Um, what are these units? 0 to 500 gram micrograms per metre cubed. What does this mean? Well, we're going to need to understand how you measure particles in an objective way. We are nearly done with the theory, I promise. It turns out that AQI, or Air Quality Index, isn't actually exactly an SI unit. It's kind of, dare I say, arbitrary. The scientific way to measure particle density, presumably, in a given amount of air, is by measuring it in micrograms per metre cubed. Which makes sense, right? Well, the world seems to prefer to use AQI in terms of popular data dissemination. So let me take you through the maths of AQI. You want to, right? Right? Here we go. Now you're probably thinking, what is AQI max, AQI min? Um, the long and short of it is that AQI is kind of based on the boundaries of AQI, which is defined arbitrarily. Now, I don't really understand the logic, but we're stuck with this formula if we want to match the data we see on the internet with the data we receive. As such, I feel that we probably want to display both AQI and micrograms per meter cubed on our home-built meter. It's also worth mentioning as a side note that AQI is supposed to be an average over 24 hours. I have no intention of designing a meter that waits 24 hours before giving you a result, so there's a bit of a fudge factor there, but you get the idea anyway. 
it's possible that we could enhance that in the future and it wouldn't be that hard to do. But enough of the theory, it is now finally Arduino time. Let's do it. I'm using an Arduino Uno. You can use actually any Arduino for this sketch. It only uses three pins outside of power and it's pretty simple. It needs 5 volt power for the sensor though, so do bear that in mind when you're choosing your Arduino board. The OLED I'm using here is just a standard 64x128 from just about anywhere. Mine's from eBay. The PMS5003 is the only other component. It's that simple. I guess you could add buttons if you wanted to change the display or something. The sketch is linked in the description, but just to briefly run through it, it uses the library from Adafruit for the OLED, as I found this one works with the standard code to set up the display. It then reads in from the PMS sensor via a function, if that data is available at the time, and then loops around showing the text on the screen via another function, and then calculates the AQI via another function. It's not that tricky actually, but of course there's a link to the code in the description as I mentioned. Now code acquired uploaded to Arduino. Here we go. Note that the code I've written here is actually different to the one I showed you on my year old model. As I said, it wasn't finished. I've improved it by removing most of the data on the screen, decluttering and adding the AQI calculation in. Now for the final test, is it accurate? Well, for that we have to test outside and compare it to the publicly available data. Um, I, I did this and I did it a lot more than I'm showing you on screen now, but unfortunately I didn't record that footage, so you'll, you'll have to take my word for some of this. Before we get to a conclusion, there's something I really wanted to mention. At the time I looked at this a year ago, the main sensor that everyone seemed to be using was the Sharp GP2Y1010AU0F, which is a perfectly memorable name, I admit. Um, I found this sensor simply isn't fit for purpose. It isn't sensitive enough for our purposes, and the code that was out there didn't actually stand up to scrutiny. I found a serious error in the code that I can't actually remember without looking into it again, and, and I couldn't find it when I looked for it online. But if you just look at the data sheet here, you can see that the density to voltage graph showing the axes as milligrams per meter cubed. Yes, milligrams. So it's not micrograms. So how can you calculate any particle density below around 150 micrograms per meter cubed with any kind of accuracy? And that would really come under the... I mean, that's, that's way above any kind of readings that you're going to get in normal... Um, normal environments. Unless you already live in a place that's so polluted that you're starting off at around 150 micrograms per meter cubed. So the code just... It was it was outputting nonsense. I'll 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 say it frankly. So I can't really recommend using that sensor for obvious reasons. It's clearly a good sensor, but it just isn't sensible for our use case as it will not give any meaningful output. So let's let's conclude. What have we achieved here? Well, We've got a working meter that shows us particle concentration for two major sizes, 2.5 and 10 microns. And we also have an AQI for PM2.5. This is exactly what we wanted, so I'll consider this to be a huge success. For the future, there's a lot of options. I would like to transmit this data wirelessly and have it stored in a database to analyze hourly or daily. That would make it a lot more useful. You could chart and graph that data. Perhaps a future episode could do that. I'll put it on the list. Obviously, one of the first things I need to do is update my old finished version to show AQI. 
The finished version uses a bare bones Arduino bootloaded at mega chip running directly off battery. If you want to see me make a video on this, just let me know, I can run through the process. Well, I hope you've enjoyed joining me for this journey and I hope it's inspired you to make one of these yourself. For a small cost and not a lot of effort, you get a pretty usable end result. See you in the next one. Don't forget to do the usual stuff with the like and subscribe button if you got this far. It does mean a lot to me as a new channel just to get this thing off the ground. That's it from me. Goodbye.